And in addition to vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, that's V2V communication, systems are also being developed that allow cars to communicate with roadside infrastructure such as traffic lights, work, and school zones. Taken together, technology rather is now often referred to as V2X, that's V2 infrastructure here, here at TIA 2015 Network of the Future is Tim Nixon. He's the executive director and CTO of Applications Delivery and Global Connected Customer Experience at General Motors. And next to him is Brenda Ann, Ann Connors. He's strategic client engagement partner of service enablement and M2M at Ericsson North America. And also on the program is David Sparks of Texas A&M Transportation Institute's Accelerate Texas Initiative. And panelists, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's towards the end of the day, and we've done a number of panels, so that was a mouthful, and I, I hope I got that out right and got your titles correct. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Absolutely. It's good to have all of you. Uh, Tim, we've talked before. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, Brenda Ann, we've just met, and um, I think you might be the smartest person I've ever met. Oh, you're too <laughs> and kind. David, uh, nice to have you. As a matter of fact, TI now is going to be at Texas A&M's football stadium very yep. soon to do a video case study on their wireless system, so we'll talk about that later. I want to talk about the intelligent transportation system, um, some of the opportunities in that market. Um, Brenda, I'll start with you. What are the opportunities for network operators in the ITS space? The opportunities for network operators are more than just the connectivity, but if we should zoom in on the connectivity, in the connectivity area for, I, for intelligent transportation systems, you have the the, the traditional connected vehicles, you have the vehicle to vehicle, and you have the vehicle to infrastructure. And so the opportunities that come into play there, particularly in the vehicle to vehicle and the vehicle to infrastructure, come into the sort of quality of service that's needed between there. And the real time nature in order to be able to do things like av uh, avoidance of collisions. So operators are uniquely positioned there because it is peer-to-peer -peer and the traditional spoke and hub type of communication doesn't have the sort of latency that might be needed in that regard. So operators can enable both with quality of service, with security that you have in the exchange of that data, as well as in the context such as location that they can add into that vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. So lots of opportunities there. And, and you have an interesting situation because if you look across the country, uh, the owners of that infrastructure, of the X piece of it, if you, if you just think of the X piece, um, it's, it's highly diverse. So you may have uh, cities who own some infrastructure, counties, states, and so forth, and, it's, and it's, uh, all of them have their own methodologies of how they create networks. And if you're deploying an ITS system within one of those environments, um, a lot's going to depend on what the requirements that owner expects. And so the opportunities for network operators really will be helping install that infrastructure if it doesn't already exist, or to leverage that infrastructure if it's already there. Uh, uh, add additional capacity because you're now going to have a paying customer because they're adding more connectivity within that ITS environment. So as a real quick example, Let's say um, you have a, uh, a set of signalized inter intersections that you want to connect back to a central uh, control point. Uh, you're going to want to have a ring network with no single points of failure if anything is cut. And maybe previously all those signals were all on timing uh, platforms requiring people to go out and, and touch them. Now you can connect them through the technology and, and have a much more efficient operation. Uh, same thing in toll environments where you might have uh, different toll roads, high availability networks, high availability systems that are leveraging that existing infrastructure. So it's additional sources of revenue for the network operators. Tim, let's talk more about V2X, a vehicle to infrastructure connectivity. What are some of the challenges there that we're seeing? Yeah, really what it comes down to is the automakers have been in a uh, kind of a chicken and egg kind of situation for a number of years. Where's the infrastructure uh, elements? What are we going to do in the vehicle? Uh, one of the things that's now becoming a reality is the cost to implement the hardware is starting to drop. And as we see that continue to drop, it's going to invite more uh, more of the automakers and more of the ecosystem providers to really take part in this ecosystem and be able to deliver the enablers in the vehicle. The other piece that's going to happen, uh, I think, from an automotive perspective is um, Obviously, the whole V to X world, whether it's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, it's really going to be made up of a number of constituent parts. 
Some of the things that we're doing at General Motors have already started to build the vehicle to infrastructure pieces for convenience and entertainment and enhancing the vehicle ownership and driving experience. That's going to get built upon because people see a real tangible benefit that they can be able to get their arms around and be able to pay for. Obviously, there's got to be something that helps offset some of the costs that are associated with it, both in the vehicle as well as out in the infrastructure. So I think as these enablers start to come together, we're going to see a wider proliferation. Uh, and of course, we're all looking for that day when this will just be ubiquitous and, and everyone uh, that's delivering a vehicle into the, into the marketplace has got this capability inherently built in. Brenda, there seems to be an endless amount of business opportunity or opportunities in the ITS space or ITS market right now. How are automotive OEMs and networking OEMs partnering up to, to realize these opportunities? Oh, that's a great question. And it really comes down to terminology as well on what is a networking OEM today anyhow. So if you look on the perspective of the automotive OEMs, whereas was articulated by Tim, there's a lot of new services and, and partners in that ecosystem that are coming into play. That's where he would like to focus because that's where the money is coming in. And so then on the back end side of that, you have this global connectivity issue of setting up that. So a networking OEM who can abstract that complexity of dealing with each and every operator globally to set up that connectivity adds a lot of value to the automotive OEM. So this sort of partnering of abstraction of complexity so I can focus on from an automotive OEM perspective, so I can focus on where I'm going to actually have monetizable value. That's going to be key in that new relationship that's forming. David, I know you have some knowledge about um, some uh, state and federal regu regulators and how they're positioning themselves in the ITS market, but specifically, let's start with the state regulators. You know, and it varies by state because, you know, different economic climates and different legislative philosophies are going to drive what happens in each state. So um, you'll have different states that may have passed legislation today. I'll pick California as one of them. Uh, to try to regulate and define what's involved with connected and automated vehicles. Uh, you have other states that haven't passed any legislation, and, and it's not by uh, neglect, it's by purposeful decision that we, why legislate something that doesn't need to be legislated today. Texas is an example uh, of one of those states. And so I think it's an evolving area and, and one that uh, the people will be watching and trying to figure out to create that certainty uh, is the as the technology advances and, de and deploys, it may become more uh, important, especially when you get into areas around liability uh, and, and other things that are responsibility driven um, uh, to, to deal with issues and create clarity for the people that are providing the safety critical uh, parts of the applications. Brenda, federal regulators defining their roles in the ITS space? Well, of course, I don't presume to, uh, to speak on behalf of regulators, but they do provide an important role when it comes to public policy. If we look at the whole vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, autonomous vehicle types of uh, play that is coming around, where do regulators have a role? That comes into things like autonomous vehicles, right? Can the autonomous vehicle be my designated driver? What's the policy around that? Who owns the data and the privacy that goes along with that data? Regulators have a role to play with that. And if we look at some successful regulations that have come about in certain countries that have facilitated the whole m iot ecosystem, let's look down in Brazil. They have a taxation framework now down in Brazil that actually enables or fosters the development of things like smart cities. And so you can look even on the GSMA website, it gives some information about what has been done by the Brazil in that regard. So these sort of taxation frameworks, policies around privacy, the rules around autonomous vehicles and whether, you know, are they made designated driver, these sorts of things, a lot of uh, area that's going to sort of unfold as, as we move forward here. Tim, any new service offerings for GM or GM-like companies that enrich um, the customer experience in the vehicle, but also enrich uh, uh, enterprises, corporations um, for, or for, for offering that service and new business opportunities. Yeah, so I would just say that if you just look at the last 12 months of what we've offered here in North America with our Chevrolet, Buick, GMC, and Cadillac brands, we've started to offer the, the base services that we've always offered for the last almost 20 years with OnStar. Now we're adding data services, things like Wi-Fi, 
vehicle data oriented services like insurance discounts, uh, things that people really put a value on for us also put a value on the attractiveness of the vehicle. Um, it's not that you necessarily have to monetize every last bit of data uh, that goes into and out of the vehicle. And from our perspective, that's the customer's data. You know, we have to get the customer's consent before we go forward and really go do a lot with that data. But at the end of the day, people value the services that come out on the other side of that data. So the same infrastructure that's going to allow a vehicle to talk to the, to the, to the other vehicles around them, or the vehicle to vehicle, or vehicle to infrastructure uh, elements, that same um, capability is now going to deliver things like I just mentioned, and frankly, the sky's the limit because once you've got that capability to, to transact data with the vehicle, whether it's the location information, vehicle system data, um, information about what's going on inside the vehicle uh, with different systems, applications that might reside in the vehicle or out in the cloud that interact with the vehicle, now it just opens up a whole plethora of things that we frankly have just started to tap. We've, we've seen what that's done to phones and we've seen what that's done in creating things like tablet uh, ecosystems. Um, I'm not sure how far it will go, but I'm sure elements of that are going to hit the vehicle marketplace and people are going to value that, both in the purchase of the vehicle as well as downstream revenue. Well, and you add on to that, that it's not just in the vehicle, but also what it interacts with, as Tim was starting to allude to, traffic. Where can I park my car? Where can I park my car? Geez, I'm getting close. Are there any, is the American Airlines Center just down the road, is there anything that's playing there tonight I happen to be in the area that I can go see and can I purchase it now and can I also then get the parking associated with it? So a lot of these other services that are coming in to make me as a consumer my life easier. Brenda, I want to uh, uh, wrap up this conversation posing a question to you and to Tim about um, some of the trends that you've talked about already that are driving the ITS market, but how you think those trends will shake out or shape up over the next three years? Basically, what's sort of a futurist question uh, of the ITS market? Well, and I, I like to look on when you talk about the future, what's happening with the young people from today, right? And so what you see in some of these trends with young people is they're looking at shared ride services. Can I just buy whatever transport I need, rent, rent that transport, if you will, for some period of time? So we see these sorts of services coming into play, and uh, let's name a few, like Uber. And where is Uber going? When you, you know, we talked about some potential uh, you know, uh, future of Uber as they've, they've uh, gambled up some, grabbled up some of these uh, brain eggheads from different universities, and where are they going to go next with that? So there's a lot of these consumer trends, and Ericsson spends a lot of time then on the consumer trends with our consumer labs. We actually have a, a paper that you can download from our site on the trends in the ICT industry and the intelligent transport systems that I encourage you to take a look at because it delves in much deeper into this area and where things would be going. And Tim, I, I did not mention I was going to finish with you, but I want to get to David just for a moment. Uh, your f uh, future for the ITS market over the next three years, but from a research perspective. Um, it, it's, it's pretty wide open, and there's a lot of opportunities there. And, and I think a lot of what we've talked about and seen are examples of disruption coming into the market and new business models and new ways of doing things. So, you know, imagine for a moment that... Um, transportation becomes more of a service, you know, and, and the nature of the way uh, you interact with your vehicle uh, and, and whether you own a vehicle, the number of vehicles you may own today and, and how you acquire that, that transportation service, whether it's an asset or, or literally as a on-demand type thing, uh, the, the market is ripe for all kinds of innovation and, and novel business ideas that try to find ways to monetize you know, the, the, the value of what this technology is going to provide for us. Yeah, and you talk about some of the recent ones and how many people have seen uh, that you can have your groceries delivered to your vehicle and because of some of the technologies like GM bring to the table, you can have your vehicle unlocked, the trunk, the groceries get put inside of it and you authorize that right, remotely. That's service, and that's the sort of uh, kind of innovative business models that I think we'll see coming into play. You didn't mention that service offering, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your future uh, futurist uh, uh, comment uh, for the ITS market? Yeah. So when I see uh, when I see what we've already got, frankly, in the in the works, I, I'm looking a little bit farther down the um, the path of what's 
uh, what's happening in automotive design right now. One of the things was already hit on by, uh, by Brenda, which is around the, the whole notion of there's a whole disruption happening with the automotive space, right? We, we've, got, we've got folks that are operating today under a 100-year-old business of buying a car, you put it in your garage, you drive it to work, you drive it to the store. But when you think about it, 90% of the time, it's sitting somewhere, right? And so the whole notion of creating a whole set of businesses around how do you take better advantage and make that more efficient from a vehicle asset perspective? Because there's some people out there, especially in large cities, the urban environments, um, you know what, they're interested in getting from A to B. They're looking for transportation solutions, not necessarily vehicle ownership. I think that's gonna, we're gonna start to see that explode. There's gonna be more of that, not just in North America, but all around the world. Uh, as, as cities get more congested and the cost of vehicle ownership is gonna go up, people are gonna look at those kinds of things. Um, the other thing I see happening is I think people are gonna start realizing that connectivity in a vehicle, which heretofore hasn't really been overly connected. You think about where you are with a connected device, whether it's home, office, a, a coffee shop, wherever, it hasn't been so in a vehicle. And I think people are gonna really start taking advantage of the fact that their vehicle is no longer this quiet, silent zone of no connectivity. It's gonna be something that they're gonna be able to take advantage of. And when you mix all of these things together, you can say, hey, you know, I can get productive, I can be entertained, um, I have convenience services, all while I'm enjoying getting from A to B in some of these new modes that are, that are gonna be emerging. It's pretty exciting space. It really is, uh, Tim, Brenda, David, uh, Tim from the automotive industry, uh, Brenda uh, from the equipment supplier industry, if I can say that, and uh, from academia, uh, David, uh, all, really great to have you guys. All of our panels today were great, but this specifically, I think, was an interesting panel, so thanks for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. You. And uh, for all of TI Now's coverage of TIA 2015 Network of the Future, please log on to tinow.org. So long. Thank <laughs> you.